follow up real quick on one thing on the marriage night. It does require a reservation. So um, if, if you are wanting to go to that, I would encourage everybody to go to that. Um, there's information out on the counter out in the foyer about how you can register to go to that. We hope to see you all on that night. Uh, good morning. Good morning uh, glad that you all are here this morning. Hey, will you turn around and say hi to everybody who's joining us on online there? We are glad uh, that everybody's joining us. Glad that you're here with us in person this morning. We're going to be in John chapter 6. So if you have your Bible and you want to flip there, stick a thumb in it, that's where we're going to be uh, today primarily uh, is John chapter 6. We are uh, in week number three of four weeks kind of looking at different things Jesus said that maybe we like to forget about or maybe we like to skip over because they're difficult or, or maybe we like to just kind of to move on from because they're a hard teaching. And so today we're going to, to dive into a hard teaching uh, that is in John chapter six where Jesus talks about eat my flesh and drink my blood. This is gonna be a good morning, I think. Uh, so <laughs> welcome to North Christian Church. <laughs> we're glad that you're here with us this morning. Um, before we dive into this, let me just say a prayer <laughs> As we, you're not supposed to laugh at that part. That's, that's not even it. Uh, let, let me say a prayer as we begin this morning. Heavenly Father, um, I am thankful for just the opportunity to be here together. Uh, thankful for the opportunity to worship and for the opportunity to open uh, your word and to look at even difficult teachings like John chapter six, like what we're going to talk about today. And I pray that uh, your spirit be here with us, that um, he move, that he challenge and convict us and encourage us, whatever um, you desire to do in our lives, God, I pray that we would have open hearts and open ears in order to uh, see that and then have the, the courage to step out and follow wherever you, you call us to. And so, uh, Heavenly Father, we just ask that you do with us as you please this morning. We're thankful for Jesus, uh, thankful for everything that he did for us on the cross, and I pray all of this in his name. Amen. So John chapter six, we find ourselves in the place where Jesus is kind of in the midst of his public teaching. And at this part in his ministry, large crowds started to follow him. Large crowds where I'm talking about in the thousands of people would follow Jesus around in order to hear him teach. And so uh, the day before what we're talking about today is the day where Jesus took five loaves of bread and two fish. You may remember the story, right? And he gave thanks to them and he fed over 5,000 people. Did a miracle right in front of their eyes and fed uh, over 5,000 people that night, that day. That night came, Jesus sends his disciples on ahead of him. They were near kind of a body of water and he sends them out on a boat to cross to the other side by morning. Jesus uh, kind of takes himself and removes himself from everybody. He goes, spends a little bit of time with God and then he goes to meet up with his, his disciples, his, his kind of inner twelve that were with him all of the time. And this is where we find Jesus walking on water. You remember this? He walks out on water to the boat that the disciples are in and the storm's crashing around them and they're scared. And Jesus walks on water. He calls, calls Peter out onto the boat. We, we remember where we're at here, okay? So Jesus and the disciples finish the night crossing to the other side. They get some sleep. The next day, the crowd, meaning the 5,000 people that were just fed by Jesus the day before, they wake up, they come together, they realize Jesus ain't here anymore. Where is Jesus? Where's the disciples? We need to find him because we kind of like hanging out with this guy. So they realize that Jesus and his disciples cross to the other side of uh, the, the body of water. So they get in boats, they take off following Jesus. They catch up with him and the disciples later on in the day. And you can almost feel when you start reading through this, that they're kind of pressuring and leaning into Jesus here a, lead, a little bit, not for his teaching. They're not, they're not saying, hey, teach us everything we need to know, right? They're not even saying, show us a miracle at this point. No, what, what they're pressuring Jesus into to kind of doing is to giving them more food. Feed us. You fed us yesterday. We want some more of that bread. We want more of that. And I get to this place when I read through this and I, and I think, what are, what are the reasons why we come to Jesus? I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not. What are the reasons why we come to Jesus? I think if we're honest, we don't always come to Jesus for the right reasons, do we? I don't think we always come to Jesus for, for the right reasons. I think sometimes, honestly, and maybe you find yourself in this place where you come to Jesus because you just don't know where else to turn. 
And maybe this is kind of your, your last effort because you've run out of options. Maybe you find yourself there, or maybe, maybe you find yourself in the place to where you come to Jesus because, well, mom and dad came to Jesus this way. They came to church every Sunday and kind of did this, and grandma and grandpa did this, and, and their parents before them did this, and so this is what we do. This is what our family does, is we just kind of do the, the Jesus thing on the weekend, whatever that means. And Sometimes I, I think, honestly, some of us come to Jesus just to see what we can get out of the relationship. I, I, think, I think some of us come to Jesus because we think, uh, you know, we've been told by somebody that, you know, when we turn towards Jesus, all of our worries just, just magically disappear, right? And all of our fears just magically disappear, and all of our troubles, and all of the sickness, and all of, you know, everything bad in life just magically goes away when you, when you just simply turn to Jesus. Others may have been promised that we would be blessed, whatever that means to whatever that individual is. I think some of us come to Jesus because we're hoping, we're hoping to see something amazing happen. It's not a bad thing, but we're, we're hoping, I think, if we get down to it, we're hoping to be a little bit entertained. We're hoping to see a show. We're hoping to see a miracle. We're hoping to see something spectacular in front of us. And while I think all of these things are an okay place to start, this is not an okay place for us to continue our lives with. We can't possibly stay in these places of just wanting more, of seeing what we can get out of this relationship with Jesus. And so Jesus, in this moment where they're just saying, you know, come on, give us more to eat. Come on, show us something more. Jesus pushes back a little bit. John chapter six, read this with me. We're gonna pick up different pieces of this. Verse 26 and 27, Jesus answered them and said, I assure you, you are, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs, not because of the show, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Don't work for food that perishes, but for food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Because God the Father has set his seal of approval upon him. Jesus is saying here, ultimately, you're looking for me, not because of who I am, not because I'm the Son of God, not because through me you can find eternal life. Jesus is saying, you're not looking for, for me because of those reasons. You're not even looking for me at this moment because of the miracles that I performed. You're looking for me, Jesus is saying, because I filled your stomach. And now it's morning and you are hungry again. And you want more to eat. And so Jesus goes on here, if you were to read these verses, and he goes on to talk about how if you were to do the right thing, you would recognize me as the one who God sent to this earth. And so they respond to that. They're like, well, how will we know? How will we know that you're the one? How will we know that you're God's son? How will we know that you're the one that, that we are supposed to put our trust in? Like maybe you should show us a sign, Mr. Jesus, right? Maybe you should do a miracle for us so that we know that you are the one. Apparently they forgot about the fact that he turned five loaves of bread and two fish into a giant meal that fed over 5,000 people the other day. And so they keep asking, what are you gonna do for us? What are you gonna perform for us? And then the crowd refers to something that's interesting that we can't miss here. In verse 31, John chapter six still, this is what the crowd says. They, says our, they said, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. Just as it was written, he, meaning God, gave them bread from heaven to eat. They're referring to, to what they probably learned as children about their ancestors in the desert as the Israelites were wandering through the desert in the Old Testament, right? God sent manna, God sent food in order to sustain them. And he did this for years and years and years, God provided for the Israelites in the desert. So Jesus responds to that in verse 32, and he, and he says, I assure you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the real bread from heaven. My father gives you the real bread from heaven is what Jesus says here. And, and so the crowd cries out for this bread. They're not understanding yet. The crowd cries out for this bread. Give us this bread that is gonna sustain us so that we never have to eat again. That's how they're hearing this. Jesus enters into this dialogue about who he really is. And he begins talking about how he is, Jesus is the bread from heaven. Jesus is the one that God sent in order to bring this to these people. He, he goes on to say that, that, that even though they have seen him, they don't believe in him. And he talks about how he has come down from heaven and that anyone who believes in him will have eternal life. And he begins kind of trying to get them to understand what he's, what he's talking about here. And, and Jesus gets down to verse 49 and we're gonna pick up and we're gonna read a, a good chunk of this to try and understand what Jesus is saying. 
But in verse 49 and following, Jesus starts really pressing in against this because they're not understanding what he's saying, right? They're not understanding what he's trying to communicate here in, in, in the bread that he's talking about. Verse 49 and following, Jesus says this, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread, Jesus is saying. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. At that, the Jews argued amongst themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, I assure you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Because my flesh is real food and my, my blood is real drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father, so, that, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. And this is the bread that came down from heaven. It is, it is not like the manna your fathers ate, and they died. The, the one who eats this bread will, be, will live forever. Jesus is trying to get them to understand what he's saying here. He's trying to get them to understand that he's not talking about temporary bread here. He's not talking about the food that we just eat throughout the day. He's talking about bread that sustains them for forever. And that's really him. He, he's trying to get them to understand this. If, we, if you jump down a few verses, if you have your Bibles and you want to jump down, you're going to start to read that the crowd is not understanding what Jesus is saying here. They're, they're not getting it. They're, and they start complaining because this is a hard teaching, they said. Oh, this is a hard teaching. How can we understand this? They say, and we learn in the following verses that, that many of the, of the followers of Jesus, the crowd, the people, you know, the 5,000 that were, that were there that wanted to hear from Jesus and wanted maybe even to take from Jesus, they began turning away from Jesus because this is a hard teaching. I, I, think, for, I think for the person who's unfamiliar with the Bible, with, with, with Scripture, with Christianity, and, and is unfamiliar with this passage, and maybe you find yourself in that place this morning. You can, you can listen to these words where Jesus is talking about, eat my flesh, drink my blood, and, and I think maybe we can, we can agree that at least this is a weird teaching, yes? Like we can, we can at least acknowledge that this is not necessarily ordinary and we can, we can, we can say that it's difficult. We, we can look at these passages and even think, well, that's, that's kind of gross, right? <laughs> what is Jesus telling us to do here? I mean, this guy, Jesus, right, who is supposed to be the most moral and ethical person that we're supposed to follow, that we're supposed to listen to and, and live our lives after, this guy is telling us that we need to eat his flesh and drink his blood, can we just acknowledge that this maybe is a hard teaching? Can we acknowledge that this is, this is, not, this is not normal, right? And, and in fact, Jesus doesn't talk like this very much, and I'm thankful for that. So rather than getting grossed out about it <laughs> this morning, rather than, just, rather than just ignoring it or tuning out because it sounds weird, or, or rather than even just skipping over this, like even I'm tempted to do sometimes when I don't understand things right away, Let's maybe look at the words that Jesus said here. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. And let's try to understand what Jesus is saying here. I think it's, I think it's easy for us to, to kind of to, to listen to words that Jesus said and think, Jesus said it, so I need to do it as he said it, right? I think we're tempted to kind of to just follow as literally as possible the words Jesus said. But the trouble with that is that Jesus uses multiple methods in order to teach Throughout, of his, throughout his time on, on earth, right? Like sometimes it's literal. Like he says, this is the way it is. Throughout the, throughout the Sermon on the Mount, I, I think that's one of the, hey, he does several things, but one of the areas that really sticks out to me is, you know, he says, you've heard it was said this way, but now I tell you this. That's not left to interpretation. He's, he's really just laying it out there for us then. But he also does things, Jesus does, like teaching parables. He, he, he uses stories in order to communicate truths that he wants us to, to hear. But then, like what we see here, Jesus does something different as well. He also uses figures of speech, which I, I think is what Jesus is doing here. So let me clear this up. 
Jesus is not saying as we follow him, we become cannibals. Not saying that. Thank you. He's not advocating that we are actually gonna eat his flesh and drink his blood. And for those of you who have been in the church for a while, I, I think it's easy for us to connect what Jesus is saying in John chapter six to the act of communion, right? It's easy for us to get there, isn't it? Because the words sound familiar, like we can connect this to what we do in communion every week here. We'll do it after this message here in just a little bit. This is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 26, for instance, concerning what we do in communion. Jesus says, as they were eating, he took bread, he blessed it and broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, and he said, take and eat, this is my body. That sounds familiar, right? And then verse 27, then he took a cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to them and said, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood that establishes the covenant, and it's shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. I think on the surface for us, it's really easy for us just to connect John 6, what we were just talking about, to Matthew 26 and the act of communion, right? It's really easy for us to get there because it sounds the same. It's, it's ultimately what we're doing in communion. We're, we're remembering the sacrifice that Jesus gave on the cross, how he, how he shed his blood, how he gave his body for us. And we take the emblems that represent Jesus' body and, and his blood. There, there's a word I wanna, maybe you've heard this before, but there's a word that's important here that we need, to, we need to remember and recognize. And the word is anachronistic. Anachronistic. The word anachronistic means uh, belonging to a time period other than what is currently being portrayed. Anachronistic, belonging to a time period other than what is currently being portrayed. I think there is a connection, thinking that there's a connection between communion and between John chapter six is really anachronistic. Because Jesus wasn't at the point where he was, he was teaching on communion quite yet. He wasn't at the place to where he was, he was telling them, do this in remembrance of me yet. He was, he was in a different time period. And the idea of, of communion and teaching on it and having that be something that we do regularly, he was not to that place in his ministry yet. That was not something Jesus was doing at this point. It was anachronistic. It was from a different time. And we have the benefit now of seeing the entire Bible, right, play out right in front of us. Like, we can jump around to different passages. We can see how it ends in Revelation. We can look at the entire ministry of Jesus, and we can know, and we can make these connections. And I'm gonna admit, there's foreshadowing happening here, right? There's foreshadowing in John 6 happening to what happens on the cross. I'm not denying that. But to equate John 6 only to communion, I think, doesn't do this story in this passage in John 6 justice. I think we miss something if we just do that. I think if we, miss, if we just say, John 6, when he's talking about eating my flesh and drinking my blood, if we just say that's about communion and we move on, I think we're shorting ourselves of something that God wants to show us in John 6. So, so what does it mean? Eat my flesh, drink my blood. I think at the core of what Jesus is saying is, is he's requesting and he's stating that if you're gonna follow me, if you're gonna follow me as, as, as savior, you need to accept me at the deepest level, I think is what Jesus is saying here. Is that if you're, gonna, if you're gonna follow me, you need to take all of me, not just little pieces of me. If you're gonna follow Jesus, if you're gonna be his disciple, then you need to come for more than just the free food. You need to come for more than just the show, more than just the miracles, more than just the flash. You need to come and accept the most intimate parts of his character, and his purpose, and his nature. If you're gonna follow Jesus, you need to follow him fully, and you need to take it all. Because what Jesus was dealing with in the context of John 6 was a group of people, a large group of people, right, thousands of people who were not wanting to take all of Jesus, who were not following him for all of him. They just wanted the pieces that benefited them. So bottom line, if we're gonna come to Jesus, we need to come ready to feed on him. We need to come ready to take in all of who he is fully. So two things I want us to, to understand more fully as we embrace Jesus saying, eat my flesh and, and drink my blood. When we embrace eating Jesus' flesh and drinking his blood, first, we begin to understand that salvation only comes from Jesus. We understand that, that salvation can only come from Jesus. Look at verse 49 through 51 again, John 6. Jesus says, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. 
I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Think about what is happening here for just a moment. Think about what Jesus is trying to do here. Jesus gives them food the day before. He fills their stomachs, right? They feel full. The next day comes, they search him out because they're hungry again. They search him out because they want to be fed again. And Jesus says, no, 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 listen. You're not looking for the right thing in me. I'm not just a buffet for you, he's saying. I, 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 you're looking for the wrong thing in life. You're not looking for what you really need. He says, your relatives wandered around in the desert for 40 years and survived because God provided food for them. But they still died. But they still died. And Jesus says, I can give you something far greater than just a piece of food that takes away your hunger for a little bit of time. Jesus says, I can give you what will sustain you for eternal life and you come asking me for bread. He says, the bread that Jesus is offering them gives them life for eternity. This is salvation. This is what we should, should be seeking in Jesus. This should be what we want. And here's what I think. I think that, that some of us need to fully embrace this idea that salvation only comes from Jesus because I think we struggle with that sometimes I think culture has conditioned us to believe that we need to do everything we can to set up protection for ourselves in different areas of life it's like this don't take this personally okay you don't just have a job you have multiple jobs that bring in more money right you do side gigs you, you know you work extra, whatever it is, in order to bring in more money. You, do, you don't have just health insurance. You have an umbrella policy, and then you have secondary health insurance, right? You, you, you don't just have a car. You have three, four, five, six cars. How many cars? Because if one, two, three, four, five cars break down, you need something to drive, right? You don't just have a house. You have two, three houses, and maybe you have another house that has four wheels and drives around the country. Here's, here's the thing. I'm not, I'm not talking any specifically about any of these things right now, but rather just illustrating the point that, that culturally we're kind of conditioned to do everything that we can to hedge our, to, to hedge our bets, right? We're, we're conditioned to do everything we can to set up protection after protection after protection so that in case something falls through or in case something doesn't work out, we have something else to protect us, right? That's how we are taught. And I think it's fair to bet that in American Christianity... Generally speaking, most of us are not 100% sure that Jesus is the only way. I think in American Christianity, we are open to the idea that yes, Jesus is a way, but he's not the way. And I think this is something that we have to deal with in Amer American Christianity. I think, I think some of us have been trying to promote Christianity and trying to bring more people um, really into heaven. And a fantastic individual, very, very smart individual. Uh, he wrote a book years and years ago called Jesus Among Other Gods. And he came out of India. And so um, he, he kind of had multiple things that he could have kind of gone to. And he says this inside this, in this book that I think is important. Ravi Zacharias says, I came to him, meaning, meaning Jesus, because I did not know which way to turn. I remained with him because there is no other way I wish to turn. I came to him longing for something I did not have. I remain with him because I have something I will not trade. I came to him as a stranger. I remain with him in the most intimate of friendships. I came to him unsure about the future. I remain with him certain about my destiny. I came amid the thunderous cries of a culture that has 330 million deities. And I remain with him knowing that truth cannot be all inclusive. Truth cannot be all inclusive. Jesus is not one way among many ways. Jesus is not one way among two ways. Jesus is the way, period. Jesus is the way. It's not all inclusive. And if we're gonna try to understand what Jesus means by eat my flesh and drink my blood, we need to understand Jesus is not saying anything other than there is one way to God and it's through me. 
Secondly, if we're gonna understand eat my flesh and drink my blood, we need to understand that Jesus is calling us as disciples to be all in with him. He's calling us to be all in with him. And we're gonna unpack this more next week a little bit, but I wanna expand a little bit today while we're here. The crowds come to Jesus. They're gathering around Jesus. Why are they doing that? Why are they coming to Jesus? They're, they're coming to him because they wanna see what they can get out of the relationship, I think. They're coming to him because they, they wanna see how he can provide for them. Hey, give us more food. Hey, give us a show. Hey, we're hungry. We, can you give us something? We, what can we get out of the relationship? And Jesus pushes back on it, right? Verse 26 and 27, let's just recap. Jesus, Jesus says to them, I assure you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. Jesus calls them out on the motives that they have for why they are coming to him, why they are searching for him, and then says, you have the wrong thing in mind, right? You have, you're coming for me for the wrong reasons. Stop looking for the food that is still gonna just leave you hungry again later on in the day. Come look for the thing that lasts for eternity that only I can give you. Go in with that, Jesus is saying. Go all in with what I can give you for eternity. And the, the visual Jesus is, is using here is really that we need to feast on Jesus, right? When we come to Jesus, we need to feast on him. We need to take all of him. We need to go all in with him. Like stop only getting a little bit out of it and then looking for something else. Go all in. We see Jesus for who he really is and we give ourselves over fully to him. That's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to be about, which again, goes totally contrary to what culture tells us to do, right? Like you can claim to be a Christian or a follower of Jesus or disciple or whatever in culture right now and at some point people look at you a little funny, right? Like even if you don't live it out, if you just claim the name of Christian anymore, a lot of times you get looked at funny, right? But, it, but then if you start to actually walk that walk, if you start to actually live that out, you actually start to, to talk about how Jesus has changed your life, how, how, you, how you're trying to live for, for his purposes instead of your own, how you're trying to love other people over yourself and, and on and on and on, that is absolutely countercultural for us, isn't it? That it goes absolutely against what what I'm with Jesus and what he calls them to as, as believers. Man, dream this with me. What would, it, what would it look like in our lives, in our families, if one, we first understood and accepted the reality that Jesus is the only way and we allowed that to transform our lives to where we are completely sold out for Jesus, what would that do to our families? Man, how would that change our families? How would it change our workplaces and our friendships? How would it change our cities? If we, how would it change our country if, if Christians across this country bought into these two things? One, Jesus is the only way, and when I follow him, I go all in with him and it transforms my life. Man, how would our country change? We have to answer that question individually. I think we can find ourselves looking for something different in life. I think we can find ourselves trying to, to find the solution to whatever problem is in our life. And I think eventually, at some point, we just end up at Jesus because we don't know where else to turn. And when we get to that place, we have to embrace these two things. We have to embrace that Jesus is the only way. And he calls us to a life of surrender. And this may be very well the answer that we're looking for in life the solution that we're looking for in life because it, it changes our lives. And so the challenge for us is to answer that question. Am I all in with Jesus? Am I going to eat his flesh? Am I gonna drink his blood? We, we hope that you will take the opportunity to consider this through the rest of this time together this morning. We wanna give the opportunity for you to respond to what God is doing in your life every week and we don't always say it but there are a few of us, myself, Mark, who you see up here, others around this building, you can ask really anybody in this room that, that want to have conversations with you. If you are at that place to where you wanna take that step and say, I wanna surrender my life to follow Jesus. I'm ready to, to acknowledge him as Lord and, and, and declare that he is the only way and I wanna give my life to him. We, we wanna celebrate that with you. We wanna have that conversation with you. We wanna pray with you and we wanna help you walk through that. 
And so if that's you this morning, please don't leave this place without finding one of us. Have a conversation with us. We wanna, we wanna walk through that with you and we wanna celebrate that with you this morning. Heavenly Father, I pray for each one of us as we think about these words that Jesus said 2,000 years ago that are difficult words on the surface but change our lives when we put them into practice. God, I pray for each one of us that, that these would not just be words that we forget about here 20 minutes after we leave here but allow them to pierce our hearts, allow them to change our lives because we fully accept you, Jesus, as the only way and because of that, because of what you've done for us, we fully surrender our lives to you. God, we thank you that you take interest in us. We thank you that through you, through Jesus, your son, that we can have a- eternal life with you, that we can be saved. God, let us not take that for granted. Pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.